Warren. The, uh, the youth that are going to the Saco Springs Youth Retreat uh, will meet this Friday at First Baptist Church at Ringmouth at 1 o'clock. They will arrive back to First Baptist Church at 1 o'clock Monday, June the 14th. So let's keep them in our prayers this week as they go down and uh, hopefully get to learn a lot and they have a good time. Memorial service for the uh, Pleasant Mount Baptist Church will be next Sunday. Uh, Brother Rufus will bring our message because uh, Brother Ryan's going to be gone with the youth down there at the Saco Springs here. Vacation Bible School will start the 14th, which is Monday week. And I think they're going to start decorating tonight and decorate pretty much every night next week. So anybody that wants to come help and volunteer to, to, to decorate and get that kind of, get this thing ready for us. And then uh, uh, First Baptist Church, their vacation Bible school starts tonight. So any of our youth that, that wants to go down there, they, they're, they're welcome to come. Welcome, come join in. Right. Alright, we're going to do birthdays first before I forget, because I'm bad forgetful. So if you have a birthday in June, would you please stand? Yes, I 
करी I 
message for you this morning. So if you're ready, you can go head over to the children's turn. Bibles to the book of Titus or the letter of Titus. We have uh, gone through a journey through the book of James that directed us as Christians of what it truly meant to be a genuine Christian and live a genuine Christian life. And prior to that, we went through the gospel of Mark as he laid out the case for Jesus Christ as our Savior, as the Son of God. So as I was looking and praying about what to move to, I just felt led to look into Titus. And so we're going to have a summer of Titus. Titus is not a very long uh, letter or book. It's only 46 total verses. And so we're going to dive into that. This compact book teaches us how to be an effective church with sound doctrine as well as active faith. Uh, John MacArthur, Pastor John MacArthur, stated that Titus is an evangelistic letter whose ultimate purpose was to prepare the church for more effective witness to unbelievers. So Titus contains, am I losing here? Titus contains basically is a manual for a church, building a church, attending with authentic people who have faith in Jesus Christ and who strive for the glory of God. I believe I was led to this book because, like I said earlier, the gospel of art presented the truth to us of who Christ is. He laid it out to us that this is the Son of God. And James laid it out to what it is that we should be in Christ. And today in Titus, we're going to start to learn how we, as Pine Mountain, as a group of church members, ought to be using our faith for the glory of God. And so that's why I'm looking into Titus, and, and we're going to see in Titus... That we're going to learn all kinds of stuff as the qualifications for God-ordained leaders. We'll look at grasping essential connections between sound doctrine and good works. We'll gain a, a fortitude of strongly reproved false teachers. We'll learn stuff about our doctrine to profess our faith into this world. And we'll understand the distinctive role of our who we are as a people moving forward in this generation. And we will live with a sense of hope and expectation that the grace of God intended. So as we're starting out, I need to give you a little bit of background as I, I try to do a little bit of, of each book that I preach, that Titus is a, a letter written by Paul to Titus, who was one of his disciples, that he was a Gentile that accepted Jesus Christ under Paul. He traveled around with Paul for several years. We, we hear about him and know about him. Uh, mostly in the book of the letter of Corinth, or the letters of Corinth, he was with Paul during that time, going through that difficult church. So Titus got a lot of experience learning and dealing with difficulties in lives and in the lives of a church. So Titus followed Paul on his missionary journey to the island of Crete, where they ended up planting multiple churches in that time. So Paul left Titus in Crete to supervise those churches, and encouraged and strengthened them. And Titus eventually became the first bishop of the church of Crete, which was really an accomplishment. Uh, while Timothy, you see, was a disciple also of Paul, lacked self-confidence, Titus was not. He was a troubleshooter. He was there. If there was a hard assignment, Titus was the man for the job. So Paul knew that, and he trusted Titus to pull it off as he left him there in Crete. Now, when I tell you about Crete, Crete was known to be a, a mainly pagan place. It believed that Zeus was born on that island, and so they had to deal with a lot of paganism. It was also important that the people of Crete at the time were known as their, you know, who, who they knew, the Cretans were known as liars. They were known as being very brutal people. They were known as being people that were just rough and tough and rugged, and they were gluttons for everything. And so you left Titus in this place, bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to these types of people back then. So this place was filled with idol worship and Titus was there to train people and ordain leaders in the church. 
So if you would, turn with me to the book of Titus. We're going to look at the first four verses here today. And we're going to stop there and start breaking it up from there. So look with me, starting in Titus 1 through 4. It says this, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those chosen of God and for the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness, and in a hope of eternal life, which God cannot lie, promised long ages ago, at the proper time manifested even his word and proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the commandments of God and our Savior. To Titus, my true child in common faith, grace and peace from God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the first thing I want you to see in these first verse, four verses is number one, that we are called to be servants of Christ. Paul introduced himself in verse one as Paul, a bond servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, the author, of course, is Paul, and that Paul is the name that he was given. He was known as Saul, and he was born, as many of you may or may not know, in a Jewish family and raised in the tribe of Benjamin. He became a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was actively pursuing and killing Christians. Paul was known to be a persecutor. He was cleaning it up, and that's where he was getting his name. He was there when the first martyr, Stephen, was stoned to death, and it said that people laid their cloaks at Saul, now Paul's feet. He was a great theologian. He was one who was well-educated. He, he tells you in Philippians he, he had everything. He was moving up in the world of worldliness, and the thing is, he said, I had everything to gain if I wanted worldly riches. And he literally says, and I count it as manure. I count it as rubbish to the glory that I have found in Jesus Christ. He set all his fame, all his forbidden. When he was walking down the road, when he came to his content of Jesus Christ, when he came into knowing Christ as his savior, he had an entourage with him. He had soldiers going around him. He was somebody in the world. He was famous. Everybody knew him. They announced who he was coming into the cities. Saul of Tarsus is coming into the city. Everybody get ready. You know, it's just like, you know, uh, in the book of Aladdin or the, the story of Aladdin, Prince Ali, mighty as he, and he's coming in there with all these trumpets and he's, everything marching in, right? Well, that was Saul. Saul had everything, and he comes and he says that I am now a bondservant to God and to Jesus Christ. I am an apostle to Jesus Christ. He is a messenger. So the persecutor who went and killed Christians, who had a name for himself, is now professing and preaching Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He has humbled himself to a servant. Because Christ himself is. Christ, as we talked about, if you look in the book of Philippians, we talked about that it says that Jesus did not hold on to the throne as it was something to be grasped, but that he humbled himself to a servant, that he came to be amongst us, that he let go of that so that we could have eternal life back there with him. He came down to here. And so with that, Paul himself humbled himself. Paul doesn't begin the letter as Paul, I'm highly educated, famous, brilliant theologian, martyr and persecutor of people, know all these people. No, he says, I come as a bondservant. And we learn that from the book of James, what a bondservant is. A bondservant was a slave that had paid off his debt, but then gave his own choice servitude to his master. So a bond servant was one who had his debt paid during that time. Slaves, pretty much, they were in, they were indebted to their master. So they had like, okay, I'm a slave and I'm a slave to Terry, but I have to work off a thousand dollars. And so I would work my thousand dollars off, and when I made that thousand dollars working for him, which would be like a he would pay me a penny a day, so it would, or a penny a month for me to pay it off. I mean, it took me a while to do it, but when I got set free, he released me. And at that point, I had a choice. I could be free, or if we had, if he was a good master and a good, fair person, I may want to stay and work for him. And by doing so, it was very common at that time that they would, 
You see in these movies, sometimes these slaves in the movies, they have a piercing and they've got a big gold ring in their ear. That was actually factual. They would pierce their ears and that was they were a free bonded slave. That he was a bond servant. He had paid his debt, but he chose to serve his master. He chose it. And so Paul, the great, or Saul, the great mighty, chose to be Paul and serve God. He put everything as rubbish. So when we studied that, we know that Paul was humbling himself before God and accepting that. And we, that is what Christianity is about. That is what James was telling us about, was that we ought to be servants of God. If you surrender your life to Christ, you surrender all of your life to Christ, just as Paul did. And you allow God to use you where you are. And, you know, and I've talked about this before. And, you know, when you serve God, it's not like everybody sometimes afraid like, and I was, you know, when I was a teenager. And, you know, I grew up in church, but I didn't know Jesus as my Savior. I grew up in church trying to do all the right things. And I already started feeling the calling in my life to serve God. And I told you, I, I literally sat on the bed and I cried because I wanted to be in law enforcement. I wanted to be a police officer. That's what I knew my heart was. And I sat on the edge of my bed and I was, I was 17 years old and I was crying. And I'm like, God, you know, I'll make a deal with you. You know, if I shoot somebody, I'll literally pray. This is a 17 year old mindset. Okay. I said, I'll have my Bible in my patrol unit and I will read them their last rites or something over them if they die. Okay. I was trying to reason this out, okay? I mean, that's what it was. But later, of course, I surrendered my life over to him almost a year later. And what it did was I did. I surrendered to the call of ministry. But at the same time, God shaped me and molded me and guided me and educated me and brought me back to the desire, which was to serve in law enforcement. And he brought me there. I served him and still serve him. But he took me down a path and brought me back as I was ready to serve him. So God's not like going to take away your dreams or the things that he has implanted in your heart when you become a bond servant for him. All he's asking is just surrender your plans to me. Allow me to be a part of them. Allow those dreams to be the dreams that I've placed in your heart and seek me out and allow me to be a part of it. So that's what a bond is about. And then he calls himself, I'm an apostle for Jesus Christ. The apostle is simply one who it means to be sent or to be a messenger. Now, during that time, the, you, know, you had the apostles like Peter and James and John. These were men who were there in the life of Christ. They sat under Christ directly and they were there at the resurrection. So that was a little bit of a different type of apostle, but they still means the messenger. So the apostle Paul was a messenger genuinely taught by Jesus Christ. And Paul told himself that I am an apostle for Jesus Christ. But as he says in the scripture in, in Corinthians, he says, I'm the least of the apostles and I don't even deserve really to be called one because I persecuted the church of God. But he also describes himself as I'm one of abnormally being born. That I came face to face with Christ on the road to Damascus. I saw him. I spoke with him. I saw the resurrected Jesus. And so I have that moment in my life that I'm kind of an abnormal apostle in considering of me with the others. But I am a messenger of God. So as a servant, we are also messengers. He sends us out to share the saving power of gospel only found in Jesus Christ. So when Paul is writing and he's announcing himself, we ourselves are the same. We are to be apostles of Jesus Christ. We are to be messengers and be sent out for him, given that gospel. In all that we do, we're to delight him and glorify him if you surrendered your life to him. That is what we're to learn from this. That as all of us come together as a church, that we're each one here as messengers of God to learn and to grow, as we're going to get into in a minute, and grow in him and have faith and understanding and knowledge. So we're not just some ignorant people. Our, our teachings are not to be 
a mile wide and an inch deep. There are many people out there. There are preachers currently here that have got like 50,000 people sitting in their thing. But if you listen to their preach, it's about as shallow as a creek bed that's pretty much dried up. Amen. That is where they're at. We are to have the meat of God and learn of God. And that's why you come here as a church body to learn and delve, delve into the faith of Jesus Christ. So, he, we're to be sent out sharing the power of the gospel only found in Jesus. So a healthy church is full of people who understand it's not their preferences or their desires or their plans. It's all about Christ and his plan to redeem the lost using you. So how are we doing serving Christ as a servant? Are we truly being a messenger? And that's referred to that we are to be servants of God and to be messengers for Jesus Christ. Our second point this morning, we get up there, is we are to be we are called and secured by God. Called and secured by God. So look with me back to the starting first three verses. It says that Paul, of course, servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those chosen of God and for the knowledge of the truth, which is in accordance to godliness, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promises long ages ago, but the proper time manifested even his word in the proclamation, which I have, was entrusted according to the commandments of God and our Savior. I know that's a lot of big words and a lot of things like what's going on scratching our head. Well, Paul's purpose was, number one, fan the flames of faith of those who've accepted Christ. His first mission was to further the faith of what it says God's chosen, right? He says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of those chosen of God and for the knowledge of the truth. So here it says he chooses us, well, looking at Ephesians real quick, if we don't know if we have it up there. It reads this, for he chose us in him, meaning Jesus, before the creation of the world to be holy, blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption into sonship through Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one, meaning Jesus, that he loves. But here, when it talks about when it's talking about Ephesians, about being predestined or being called into the sonship or being chosen in Christ, and I'll, I'll preference that, that we are predestined in Christ to be like Christ. Once you are in Christ, that you are become the adopted ones in the sonship of Jesus Christ. But many people want to sit here and, pray and preach that, and this one says, oh, look right here. It says, for the faith of those chosen of God. See, they're chosen, they're predestined or whatever. That is not what this is saying. I just want to address it real quick. Here, in Titus, Paul focuses more on the connecting Christians in Crete to the Old Testament chosen ones of Israel. You even had some Jewish people, Jewish Christians, who had fled from Jerusalem to the island of Crete to escape the persecution of, of Jerusalem. So he's, he's trying to tie in the elect or the chosen one. The Israelites were deemed by God as his chosen people. The Israelites from history, we know God out of the nations of the world chose the Jewish Israelites to create the promise through Abraham, through Isaac, through Israel to become his chosen people. Their job was to show the light of the world to all of the world. They were to teach of the one God, Yahweh. He is God. He is the creator. He is the almighty. He is everything, our, our savior and our redeemer. But instead, the Israelites took on the, the attitude of, oh, look, we are the chosen ones. We're the special ones. We're this. We're, we're better than you. And that is not what God intended. God intended to use that world and that nation of people in order to redeem the entire planet. That's why Christ came through that lineage. That is what they were chosen for, was that bloodline that Jesus Christ came for the whole world. That is why Jesus himself said, for God loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Not the Israelites, not just Jews, not just the people of Jerusalem. He said God loved the entire planet. 
And that is why Christ came. And he chose those people. So when Paul writes here that I'm writing to you as for the faith of those chosen by God, the word used here, eklekos, means to select or chose, describes people. It's to describe people who choose to follow the Lord that become their choice freely. He's not talking about anything about predestination. He is talking about how these people chose to follow Christ and that he is there to boisterous or fan the flames. It's this same word is the same word that we get ecclesia, which is the church, which means the sent out ones. So you have the selected chosen one who have accepted Christ and us together here on Pine Mountain we're the ecclesia. We're the sent out ones. We've chosen Christ as our Savior for us to be sent out to the rest of the world. So he was there to fan the flame of their faith so that they have knowledge of the truth. Paul is showing the main purpose we see is about faith and knowledge. That he is writing to them to show them that we are to be a bond servant of Christ. We are to serve Jesus as our Savior. We are to call ourselves apostles or messengers of God. We have chosen God as our Lord and Savior. And we are to have the knowledge of the truth as our background in the midst to show this whole world which is in moral chaos as it was in Crete. He was there in a place that I told you they were liars, they were brutes, they were deceivers, they were thieves. They were thugs, and he placed in the midst of all these people his son Titus by faith. And he says, I want you to present the love of Jesus Christ, and you're going to present it with the knowledge of the truth that he is Lord and Savior. Folks, that is what we are supposed to be doing today in this world that is becoming morally corrupt. We are falling away. We are, we are truly, what he wrote in Timothy wrote to Timothy that there is coming a day where this world will pick teachers of their own false doctrine that will tickle their ears, that they will like what they have to hear so that they can deny the creator himself. They want to push God completely out. If you don't think the United States is not doing it now, you're mistaken. They are. They want to push God out of the schools. They want to push God out of your lives. They don't want... They don't want a guy kneeling on a football field to pray before a football game. They want to chastise him because, oh, he's over there praying in the end zone. My goodness, folks, they don't want any of that. They will attack your faith. They want to mock you. They want to do everything else. God here, and Paul here saying, I'm here to teach to further the knowledge that you have of the truth. He says in Romans 1.16, I think we have that up there. I am, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first the Jew, then the Gentile. A healthy church is full of people who are passionate about the coming of their faith in Jesus Christ and are willing to do anything short of sinning to share the gospel with others. That is what it means to be truly sold out for him. <laughs> To not be ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because of the power that it brings salvation. We have the power to show someone and give them hope. And if we have to ask ourselves, are we growing in godliness? We're not to be a people that just walk the aisle and say a prayer and come to the faith. We're to grow in that faith. We're to lift our, come up. We're to, we're to start in kindergarten here on the floor and we're to graduate when we get into heaven. We're to be growing our entire life. I've said it many, many times, or I've used it before. Some of people like it, some of you don't. One of the things I did actually respect of Pope John Paul II was they were asking him to retire when he was in his 90s, and he looked straight at them, and he said, who am I to resign to? The man that I serve and live will get my residence, will let me know when it's time for me to resign because he'll take me to him in his 90s. Folks, that's what we're to be about. To be in our 90s saying when God's ready for me to go, he's going to bring me to him. I'm going to help and serve God however I can in the ecclesia, in the church, in here together so that I can help people to fan the flame. Our older folks, that we're here as younger folks to help learn from you because you've lived a life of faith longer than us. 
how to stay faithful until I'm 80, how to stay faithful, how to help us in marriage, how to help us with our children, how to help us to serve God all the way up into our 80s and our 90s in teaching. That is what we're to do. We're to give our knowledge to the next generation. And we as a younger generation should not be mocking the older one. We may have understand technology better. We may have all these things, but I want to tell you the truth. I learned so much from my elders, from my granny, from my pop about different things about farming. Yeah, we might have some equipment that does better, but sometimes you speed up a process, you actually lose the knowledge of why that process happened. Two weeks ago, I came into work and uh, stopped up at the Jackson Holly Pond and uh, there's some old elderly men sitting at a table. Most of them are in their upper 80s and 90s. And they're like, well, come on, young buck. There's just the four of us in there. Come on. I was going to sit by myself. And they're like, no, no, no. Come over here. Have a seat with us. So I sat down with them. And all four of them retired from NASA. And had actually worked on some of the rockets that we had launched. That they had worked with uh, Von Braun himself up here in Huntsville. And getting to sit down and talk to them and knowing that our day and our kids' day, you got on your phone, you can just Google it, right? You can just Google it up. When I was coming up, my mom bought the whole stack of encyclopedias. You had to look it up. That was one of the whole things. So, you know, it's like, Mama, how do you spell pneumonia? Look it up. What? And you're sitting there looking in the ends the entire time like, I can't find pneumonia, you know? How do you spell, you know, a gnat? <coughs> And you're looking in the book. Nowadays, you can say, hey, Siri, spell pneumonia, right? But the process that my mom was teaching was get into the book and find the information yourself. What we have lost in our generation is these four men, they sent people to the moon and they built rockets and they set our, our country in motion. And all they had was this thing called a slide rule in their brain as a calculator. They did all the math up here. My dad is one of them. He's one of the smartest men I've ever known. He's forgotten more than I will ever know. The fact that he is, I called him the human calculator because he could add things up in his head just like this because he had to. Nowadays, y'all, hey Siri, what's five times 55? I mean, some of y'all do that in your head real quick. I understand it, but... My point is, we lose, young friends, the understanding of how we get the answer and the process. Folks, that is why it's neat to go back and understand why these are written and why we're supposed to be fanning the flames of faith. We're to be serving God and learning from them that, yes, it was no different in Titus's day of having immorality running rampant where he was living and trying to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've got Facebook, we've got social media outlets, we do all this stuff, you know, that we can send the gospel of Christ to anyone. It's very easy now. You can send a text message, you can do a TikTok dance saying how much you love Jesus, right? You can do all kinds of stuff sharing the gospel that they didn't have. They had by foot and mouth to teach people about the power of Jesus Christ. And folks, we have so much today that we have the power and the ability to share that and to be sent out to further what? The faith of God's chosen and their knowledge of the truth. Why? Because knowing the truth leads to godliness. That's what Paul says. I'm here for the faith of the chosen for their knowledge because that knowledge leads to godliness. The more you know about Christ, the more you walk in Christ, the more that you allow Christ to be a part of your life, the more godliness comes around you. So Paul didn't want the Christians just to know faith in Jesus. He wanted them to grow in their knowledge of the truth. And we talked about the truth on Easter when I presented the whole thing of what the truth is. The truth is Jesus lived. He died and he resurrected and there was witnesses and there was proof and there's writings to prove that it happened. It's not something that was made up. So you either come to understand the truth and live the truth. That's 
how you present the truth because you understand it. You know that Jesus Christ raised from the dead and you have that hope and glory because you know that he has made the bridge for eternal life. It's fact. It's truth. So to further the faith of God's chosen, their knowledge of the truth, because that leads to godliness. It is possible to have a lot of knowledge, but have also no life transformation. In 2 Timothy, uh, Paul says to the, the people that are always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. He was not only was Titus to identify leaders that were responsible, they're supposed to not only take this knowledge, but to put it into practice. I was that person. You know, my parents did whatever they could. I, like I told you, I joked that I had a drug problem growing up. I, every time the doors of the church opened, I would drug the church. Mama drug me. You know, growing up in the uh, Catholic faith that I grew up in, you know, it was so embarrassing for me because I didn't understand or I did kind of understand that during Lent that we had to go on Ash Wednesday early in the morning, had to get up before I went to school and we had to come for prayer and then the priest would take his thumb, dump him into some ashes and put a big cross on my head that by the end of the day just looked like I had a big dark spot because I wasn't allowed to wash it off until that night. So I had to go to school with this big dark spot on my head and everybody's like, hey man, you got some dirt on your head. And I'm like, no, I don't. You know, I got some ash on my head. Well, you got dead people on your head? No, I ain't got dead people on my head. I had knowledge. I knew Jesus Christ was born of Mary. I knew what about Christmas. I knew about Easter, but none of that had penetrated the heart of my soul. It was just knowledge. Jesus was no different than George Washington. He was just a man. And it wasn't until I was 18 that I developed a relationship with my Savior. So, salvation through the knowledge of the truth leads to sanctification. You come to accept Christ as your Savior. Peter writes this in 1 Peter 3. It says, His divine power has given us everything we need for the glory, godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. We are going to meet, and shortly, Titus has to go up against false teachers who infiltrated, infiltrated the churches. Having a knowledge and the truth of God in today's world, you can, out, you can see that we do have in our today teachers and false leaders that are teaching false doctrines and who are getting money for it and they're not teaching the word of God, which is the truth. And that is the purpose of a truth here at Pine Mountain is that we are to have fan the flames of our faith. And we're to take in the knowledge of the truth so that we can live as a church, a church of godliness made up of individuals who are living a life of godliness. Who are impacting families for Jesus Christ. It all starts, though, here with me. To be a servant of Jesus Christ, accepting Christ, knowing that he has called me to serve him, and finally, you know, understanding that through that acceptance that we have eternal life. Folks, there, there is a real heaven and a real earth. It says here that we are to fan our faith for the chosen ones. We are to hear, to have the knowledge of the truth. We're looking in verse 3, that it lives according to godliness. Why? In the hope of eternal life, which God cannot lie, promised you ages ago. Folks, the, the truth and know that Jesus is our Savior. By putting our faith in him, no matter what the cost. We kind of talked about it. We're, we're doing the Job in, in the Sunday school. Job gets his life crashed. And he kneeled down, strips his clothes naked before God and says, I was naked in my mother's womb and I will leave this place naked for the Lord gives us and the Lord takes us away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He, he understood who God was in that time of trial. Folks, if you know Jesus Christ, this time is but a vapor. It's what James told us. We know that there's a hope of eternal life, which God has promised and he doesn't lie. My grandfather on my mom's side, and I actually called her to get her permission to tell the story because she gets emotional about it. 
But I, I told her why I wanted to use it because it shows that a person who loves Jesus and has a hope of glory in the midst of a time of trial has that hope for a future that this is only passing. My grandfather on my mom's side died when I was six. I did have wonderful memories about him, but he died of cancer. And he was a World War II vet. He was a big man. He was about 6'2". He was very barrel-chested. He was a bombardier. He fought on two war fronts in Europe and over in Japan. He was a man's man. And he was also a believer in Jesus Christ as his Savior. He was faithful. His, he had his family in church. He was all about being in church. But the back in the 80s, of course, we still have problems with people with cancer today. And so the cancer started to eat his body. And it overtook this big man that I have these great fond memories and share his birthday. I was his birthday gift when I was born. So we had a special bond together. Uh, they, his last name was McNulty, and he became Big Mac when I was Little Mac. So he carried me around wherever I went. And so granddaddy, he was dying, and he went from being about 235 to 240 pounds um, to 130 because the, the cancer was eating him. And so they ended up having to actually paralyze him because the pain was so intense and severe, medications were no longer working. They, they, they just stopped because the pain medicine didn't do anything for him anymore. So the time was coming, and my mom was there visiting, and she got the blessing of being by his side. And the pain was so severe, and he had eaten up his body that he couldn't speak anymore. So he was laying in bed. And they were, she was there, and she said, you know, of course, she was talking to her daddy, my grandfather, and she was holding her hand, his hand, and she said, no, all of a sudden, he gripped, and it was a strong grip, her hand, which is surprising, because he had, really had nothing left in being paralyzed, but she got a grip. She said, a cross at the end of the bed was a cross hanging on the wall, and all of a sudden, he focused on this cross, and wouldn't respond at all. Just sat there, completely gazed on the cross of Jesus Christ. She said his eyes became very blue, because they are blue, but she said they became a bright blue. And she said he had been very, of course, you know, many of you see people who have been dying or have been, they become very pale. They're, it's like their, their color leaves their skin. She said it was all of a sudden, it was like someone was shining a, a flashlight upon his face. It started to have some color only on his face. And she said he looked straight at the wall and she was trying to talk to him and he had no thing. And all of a sudden he spoke for the first time in months and said glory and passed. Folks, we have get chills this day. When you know Jesus Christ and your Savior and you're in the midst of the worst thing that you can imagine, I'm just telling you, we have the hope of glory that there is. this is nothing but a shell. This is only a vapor. This is only your time that you develop yourself for God. This is your moment, your gift that God has given of this life to come and seek him and find him. That's what the Bible says, that I have placed you here at this moment, at this time, at this decade, at this year, that you may seek me and that you may find me because I'm not far from you if you only seek. Jesus said, if you will seek me, you will find. If you knock, I will open the door. All you have to do is come to me and acknowledge me and put your life before me. It is at that time, he said here, at the proper time, the, by the word of God, the proclamation, it was revealed. God cannot lie. It is through Jesus Christ that everything was revealed through the proclamation of what? His word, which is the truth. God revealed his promise of Jesus Christ through his word and the life and the resurrection of him. So what drove Paul? What is to drive Titus, what it should be driving us is that we have the cure and the hope of eternal life that we can focus on Jesus Christ at the cross at the end moments of our life and yell, glory. That is the life of a genuine Christian that we have something that this dark world doesn't have. Amen. They want to fill us with their toys, not eternal life. 
John 17, 3 says, Now this eternal life that you know, because you know Jesus Christ, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. Christian lives in perpetual hope that we are only travelers through this world towards our heavenly home. So I ask you this morning, are you 100% sure that you're going to heaven? Are you 100% accepted Jesus Christ? Because it is only Jesus Christ that is the truth. There is no other way. Buddha is not going to take you there. Confucius is not going to take you there. <clears throat> Muhammad is not going to take you there. You are not going to get you there. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is no one here that is perfect. There is no one here. Sin cannot stand in the presence of God. Sin cannot be in his presence. So Jesus Christ had to come. He had to be the sacrifice that took upon all of our sin, as we talked about on Easter, that Jesus Christ became our sin so that we may have eternal life. And I end with this. It says this in John 3, 36. Whoever believes in the Son, Jesus Christ, will have eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life. For God's wrath remains on you. If you don't have Jesus Christ in your life, if you have not surrendered your life to him, there is only one path for you, and that path is destruction and, and hell. Hell is a real thing, people. It's as real as the ground I'm standing on. It's as real as the heaven that I long for. It is as real as that, and I don't want anyone, I don't care who you are, to go to hell. I want you to know Christ. And that is the only way. I am the way, the truth, and the life through Jesus Christ. We are to serve him. He is calling us to him. You must accept him. That is your choice. He will give you the life that you want, whether you want to live the life here or you want to live a life here with abundance and joy and security and foundation and then one day be in eternity. We only see what's in front of us. Heaven is real. I know it is. And I pray that you have accepted Christ as your Savior and that you surrendered it to him. Let's all stand for prayer. Lord, I pray right now, if there's anyone in this room that doesn't know you, that today will be the day. Lord, that they will just say, Lord, I, I've tried this life on my own, but today is the day that I want to surrender to you. I want to give you the will, so to speak, Lord. I want you to take over the driver's seat of my life. Lord, there may be someone in this room who has wandered from the path and it's time to come home. Lord, that they feel that they are dirty, but you can clean them instantly with confession and redemption. Lord, I pray for them right now that they need to come home, that the altar is open for them. God, I pray for anyone that needs a home, that they will find a home here in this church. And Lord, I pray for our church right now that we will be embodied by the Holy Spirit and that we are chosen by you and that we are sent by you into this dark world. Let us, Lord, be a light in this community and into the everywhere that we are. Lord, I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Page 342, just as I am. <laughs> So I'm going to try to speak up. I pray that God has inspired you and has comforted you uh, this morning. And I pray that you will go and seek him and serve him and surrender to him in all that you do.
because he wants to just to glorify and lift you up and use you to be the light of this world. Lord, I, I thank y'all for being here. Brother Jeff, would you close us in prayer? Amen. God, we do thank you for this day, Lord, that you've given us so Amen. thankful for this church, Lord, and for the opportunity that you've given us to come here and worship today, Father. And we're thankful for our church family, for our pastor, Lord, for all that he does for us. We thank you for all that you do for us, Lord, and we pray that you will continue to lead us and guide us and direct us in a, in a world that is cruel and hurtful and just help us to remain with you, Father God. Give us the strength. And we're thankful for forgiveness and for, for your grace, Father. I pray for the sick and afflicted. That you just be with us, Lord, and just heal them if it be thy will. And pray for safety of us as we go our separate ways. In Christ's name we do it out. Amen. Amen.